So let's start off with a few announcements. Um, so I've updated the schedule on Canvas. <clears throat> I mentioned last week we shifted the homework due date a little bit. Uh, so here's what's coming up. Homework four will be due this Wednesday, October 7th. And then homework five will be due the following Wednesday, uh, October 14th. So take a look at those. Those are posted. Lab four is due Friday. And then you'll start lab five on Friday. Take a look at that due time on Canvas. Um, I'm probably going to move out the exam, exam two, uh, by a week. So the new date will be October 28th. I want to give time to be able to work the homework, homework six, uh, which is going to involve diodes and transistors. So I want you to be able to work that and get the solutions and be able to study from that. So I'm probably going to move that out. Let's say I am going to move that out. And also, I'll announce the upcoming quizzes. They're not listed there yet, but I'll give you plenty of notice for, for those problems. They'll continue to be basic, uh, you know, basic problems from the material. So if you have any questions during class, please unmute or shoot me a chat. And I've got the window open. And if I catch it, I will answer you via chat. Um, otherwise, please stay muted to keep the background noise low. Okay, so last time uh, we we ended up uh, talking with about phasers, and I showed you a derivation of uh, where a phaser comes from, how the amplitude and the phase of a sinusoid expressed as a cosine uh, is represented with a complex number. We talked about the complex plane. And the derivation isn't as important for applying this concept in this class. Uh, this is background just to show you where it comes from, and we're going to talk about applying it today. So I didn't want to leave you hanging uh, or leave you without the background. The important part, the takeaway of this phasor derivation is at the bottom of this slide. So on the left-hand side of these arrows, you see the same thing. Uh, repeated three times. This cosine sinusoid, uh, represented as a cosine, uh, has an amplitude A, a frequency omega, and a phase of theta. And you can represent that cosine three ways, in exponential form, in polar form, or in rectangular form. And these are the ways to do that. You'll notice frequency is not represented. What we're going to do is we're going to hold the frequency at the beginning of the program, uh, beginning of the problem, we're going to assume that the uh, frequency uh, remains constant, and then we'll use it again uh, toward the end of the problem, and I'll show you how that works. <clears throat> okay, so what I want to do uh, today is start off with a simple example of adding two sinusoids together, and then work on to some uh, circuits concepts with phasers and impedance. So remember that uh, I, I showed on a slide that if you, if you add two sinusoids, instead of doing that, you can add the two phasers and then convert those phasers back to sinusoids. And I'll show you how to do that now. <clears throat> yes. A uh, quick question on the meaning of that last slide with time domain and phasor domain. So sure. um, for the exponential and polar, um, are those thetas the same thetas as you see in the sinusoid form? Yes, these thetas are the same. So the, the theta on the left, here, or in all these equations, the theta on the left is the same as the theta on the right. And so so is the A. OK. Okay, mm -hmm. gotcha. That's right. In fact, you, that it's good to bring this up now. The way to convert a, let's say, a polar form of a sinusoid is to take the a part. Let's say it's five, and you write on the right side. You write five, and then if the angle is thirty degrees on the right side, you just write thirty degrees after the angle sign. And I'm I'm going to show you how to do this today. But but it is that easy. There's no no real trickiness about it. It's it's that easy to convert a time domain sinusoid to these phasor domain uh, 
representations of sinusoids. Okay, um, so let's do this. Let's move over to this phaser example here. So let's suppose, as I mentioned, we want to just add two sinusoids together. So let's suppose we have, um, I don't know, two voltages, V1 of T. So that's a time domain voltage. And I'll make this up, right? It's, uh, I made it up before class, but it's 20 cos omega T uh, minus 45 degrees. Okay, uh, overall units of volts. Let me point something out here. I kind of violated units that I described uh, earlier uh, in, in the last class. So, uh, I, I, well, I have an amplitude of 20 volts, that's okay. But look at my argument of my cosine. I have omega, which is uh, radians per second times seconds. I've got radians in this term. And then to the right, I have this 45 degrees. That doesn't work. Right? But it's common to do that. It's wrong, but it's common. What I mean by that is if you were to actually calculate this value inside this cosine argument, you'd have to either convert uh, both of these to radians or both of these to degrees and use the, the right uh, cosine uh, function. And that operates on either radians or, or degrees. Okay, so, so, but let's just, let's just accept that we do that. We just, you know, we do that, we mix units there. Um, I'm also going to define V2 as a sine and not a cosine, just just to show you how to handle it. Okay, so I have these two voltages. This is 10 sine omega T plus 60 degrees, again, mixing units in the sine argument. Um, and I've, I've got a sine. I normally uh, y y use phasers. I convert time domain functions to phasers using cosines. So I'm going to have to convert this sinusoid to a cosine before I convert it to a phasor. And so let's suppose I have these two voltages and what I would like to find um, is the sum. I wanna find V3 of T, which is V1 plus V2. Okay, so just V1 plus V2 of T. And here's how I'm going to do that. Um, instead of trying to oh, use identities and add these the, the sine and cosine together and get one expression, I would like one expression that is a, uh, an amplitude times a cosine omega T plus a phase. V1 plus V2, since V1 and V2 are the same frequencies, can be expressed as a single cosine term. And so I'll show you that. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do here is use the phasor approach. And what I can say is V3, uh, so if I add in the time domain, I can add in the phasor domain and it's the same result. In other words, instead of working in the time domain, I'm going to convert V1 to V1 phasor so phasors I'm representing with underlines under the voltages, okay? When I have a parentheses T, that's a time domain function. When I have an underline, that's a, um, a, a phasor. It's generally a complex number. So all my complex numbers will have underlines under the variables. But what I'm going to do is I'm going, going to convert V1 to a phasor. I'm going to convert V2 to a phasor. I'm going to add those phasors together I'll get a resultant phasor, V3, and then I'll convert that phasor back to the time domain. Okay, so we're gonna convert from time to phasor domain and then do our operations, convert back to time. Um, okay, so remember these phasors are, they're just vectors. They're vectors that start at the origin, extend out to some point expressed in Cartesian polar or exponential. Okay, so we're going to be adding vectors. So let's convert V1 to a phasor, V1 phasor. Well, this is pretty easy. Um, I showed on that slide that the, uh, let, let's convert this to polar form. That's pretty easy to do from a, a cosine term. The magnitude 
of the phaser is going to be the amplitude of the cosine, so it's 20. The angle of the phaser is going to be the phase of the cosine term, minus 45 degrees. Okay, so that's it. That's that's uh, that's the phaser that represents v1, 20 at an angle of negative 45 degrees, units of overall units of volts, because it's representing a voltage waveform. So let's convert time domain voltage v2 to a phaser. Remember, I have to work with cosines. So let's convert V2 to a cosine term. So if you remember, let me use a different uh, angle term here, sine of phi, just some value phi in angle, equals cosine of phi minus 90 degrees. OK. So I, I'll apply this to V2, and then I can say, well, V2 in a cosine form, oops, it's not a phasor, it's cosine, V2 of T, is equal to 10 cos phi, which is, right, I'm replacing the whole argument of the sine with phi, so that's omega T plus 60 degrees minus 90 degrees, Right. So that equals 10 cos uh, omega t minus 30 degrees. Okay. So that's the that's the v2 term, and now I can convert uh, v2 of t to v2 phasor. So v2 phasor is right. It's not that hard to do. It has a magnitude equal to the amplitude of the cosine, and it has an angle equal to the phase of the cosine. Okay, overall units of volts. Okay, so now we have two phasers. Um, just to emphasize that these are just vectors, let me represent these phasers on the complex plane. So let me draw a, an axis, axis of the complex plane. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skew the origin a bit so that I emphasize this lower right quadrant. Uh, so zero, zero is right where the axes cross. And I'm doing that because I'm, I'm going to be uh, working in this lower, uh, lower right quadrant here where these phasers are. Okay, so this is the real axis, right? Positive direction for the real axis, positive direction for the imaginary axis. And let's let's draw V1 um, on, on this axis. Okay, so it's going to be, change colors here, a vector or a phasor of length 10 at an angle of negative 30 degrees relative to the real axis. Remember the real axis is zero degrees. It's gonna be something like, oh, I'm sorry, wait, no, I'm doing V1, 20 at an angle of minus 45 degrees. So let's do that one first. So this is uh, length 20, right? And an angle down from the real axis, minus 45 degrees, right, V1. Um, and so that's it. That's what that phaser, uh, that's what it represents on the complex plane. Let's also draw V2. Oops, I lost my video. So V2 would look something like this. Let, let me kind of exaggerate the angle a bit. Let me do a different color. So it's not the scale. This is length 10. And it's down 30 degrees right from the horizontal axis. We label these axes real, imaginary. And so those, those are the two phasers. Um, so what I want to do is, well, add these two together. This is 
uh, V1 phaser, this is V2 phaser, and I want V1 plus V2 to find V3. Okay, so let's do that. Let me come up here and draw another complex plane. Again, I'm gonna, we're working in this lower right quadrant, so we're going to exaggerate that. real and imaginary axes. And um, what I can do is I can, well, redraw these. When you add two vectors together or two phasers, remember you can you can go uh, uh, tip to tail of the next vector that you're adding. So let me exaggerate these angles so they work out a bit. So this would be V1 and that's supposed to be 45 degrees, negative 45 degrees. Right. And then I can draw uh, V2. So this is length 20 and then draw V2 here. Again, I'm gonna kind of exaggerate the angle so that the drawing looks better. And this would be length 10, this is V2 phaser. Right. So two phasers like that, and it's down 30 degrees from horizontal length 10 for phaser V2. And what we want is, well, the, the, the resultant. So the resultant would look like this. So that's V3. So let's let's figure out what that is because that that's the answer we're looking for before we convert back to the time domain. Okay. Um, well, let's figure this out then. Um, v three. writing this over again, V3 is V1 plus V2. Um, what I would like to do is, well, it's easy to add vectors or phasers um, when you use Cartesian coordinates. So let's figure out what the values are of these phasers and Cartesian coordinates. So let's come over here to V1. Let's see, its real value is its projection along the real axis. Um, its imaginary value is the projection along the imaginary axis. So real value, imaginary value. Uh, so now we're down to trig. This is just doing some trig. Figure out this leg of the triangle given the hypotenuse, uh, well, for the real value, figure out this leg of the triangle or this leg of the triangle given the angle 45 degrees and the hypotenuse 20. Okay, so this would be 14.14. That's what that value is. So uh, let's see, 20 times cosine 45 degrees gives you that leg, right? Likewise, figure out the leg of the triangle, uh, you know, the length of this leg of the triangle or this leg. That would be 20 sine 45 degrees. So that would be negative J 14.14. 14.14. Okay, you do the same thing for V2. Well, before I do that, let me write out what, what I just did. I said V1 is 14.14 minus J 14.14. Right? So that's that's V1. To that, we have to add V2. So V2, let's see, the real part of phaser V2 is 10 times cosine 30 degrees, and that gives you 8.66. The imaginary part is uh, 10 times sine of 30 degrees. That gives you minus J5. Okay, so 
V2 is, make sure you can see this, 8.66 minus J5. Okay. Um, when you're, so it might help to review complex numbers. There's an appendix in the book you can read and get this all over the web, how to add complex numbers, how to multiply complex numbers. I'm going to recommend you do it with your calculator in a minute. Um, so to add these complex numbers, you add the reals together. And so I get uh, 22.8. I add the imaginaries together, I get uh, minus J 19.14. And so that's what V3 is. That's, that's this phaser. So right, you can come down here. This is 22.8. This is minus J 19.14. And so now that I have the uh, legs of the triangle that represent V3, I would like to get this V3 phaser in polar form because when I have polar form, it's easy to convert between phasers and time domain functions. So the way you do that is, well, uh, again, trig. So if I have a triangle that has one leg is 22.8 and, um, and so I would like to find theta, I'll call that theta three. Um, and I would like to find the, the magnitude uh, of V3. So again, I have, I have the leg the one leg, I have the other leg, 22.8, 19.14. I can take the arc tangent. So right, the opposite over adjacent to find theta three, take the inverse tangent, the arc tangent, put it in the right quadrant. And what's that angle come out to be? That angle comes out to be oh, minus 40.01 degrees. And then you can figure out the length of V3 using Pythagorean theorem. You have, again, both legs find the hypotenuse. So the magnitude of V3 is 29.77. Okay, so now I can specify that phaser in polar form. Hmm? When you do that calculation, are you just kind of ignoring what J is? Like oh, you mean? Theta? Uh, um, well, so yeah, you know, so yeah, why am I leaving J out of the Pythagorean theorem, right? Is, is that the question? Yeah, I just was confirming that, like, we didn't need to involve it anywhere because it's, we're just doing trig, but it technically is on a complex plane. Right, you know, you could view, it, I could also, forget about the complex plane, I could call, I could call this, um, V3 equals 22.8 uh, AX unit vector, right? Uh, minus 19.14 AY unit vector, right? And those unit vectors, when you calculate the length of that vector, you leave the AX and the AY off, right? You're not, you're not actually going to use those when using Pythagorean theorem or, or the arctangent function. So the only thing that J is doing is separating it is distinguishing between the vertical component on the comp uh, on a two-dimensional plane and the horizontal component. So that's why I'm just using it to differentiate the two dimensions, and I don't need to use it in my length calculation for that okay, phaser. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Like, you know, it, and it's weird because you gotta, you know, if you look at the J, it can get confusing. It's a square root of negative one, and how does that fall into calculating the magnitude of a phaser? But if you just think about that J as distinguishing between the components of the two axes, right? You have two orthogonal axes, two right angle axes. How do you distinguish one number 
along one axis, one length, one component from another, and it's by using that J. And because of the rules of complex numbers, it just works out that um, it operates like a like two-dimensional unit vectors. Okay, so so V3, so this is Cartesian form in polar form, uh, you would get 29.77 at an angle of minus 40.01 degrees, right? Overall units of volts. I'm pretending I have a voltage waveform here. Okay, so, so that is V3 in polar form. Now it's straightforward to calculate V, oops, that's not a phaser, V3 of T. Okay, so to go from the phaser V3 to the time domain value V3 of T, the amplitude of the cosine is the magnitude of the phaser. The function is going to be a cosine. The frequency is going to be the same, omega. If it was 200 radians per second, it's still 200 radians per second. The phase is going to be the angle of the phaser, minus 40.01 degrees volts. Okay, so, so you mentioned that we could combine these because are V1 and V2 at the same frequency omega? Are you gonna, like in the future, talk about what to do if they're not? Yeah, so let's talk about this. I, 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 well, I'll mention it now. The problems that you're going to work with are going to be, they're going to have sources that all have the same frequency. Right? They all might be a thousand radians per second for omega. And then, and then you operate like this, right? What I just did, um, using phasers f for that one frequency. And, and I'll talk about where frequency comes into play in a minute, but if you have a circuit with two different frequencies, um, you would actually work one frequency at a time. So you have maybe 500 radians per second and 600 radians per second. You would use superposition and you would turn off one of the sources, right? And, and solve for the other and then uh, you know, flip-flop sources, turn the other off, turn one on, and then add the results together. Your answer would be uh, a result with, with two frequencies in it. We're not going to cover that, but I wanted to mention that. Um, it's, it doesn't make the problem any harder. You just use superposition on each of the frequencies. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, I had a question. Yes. So from this, it kind of looked like like we started like we converted um, the original V1 V2 to um, polar phase reform, but then we ended up kind of having to uh, put them in Cartesian form anyway. So I'm wondering why didn't we just work completely in Cartesian form? Because in Cartesian form, the um, the form we were given A plus J B is an A just um, the magnitude cosine theta, and then B, the magnitude sine theta. So you could have solved it that way. You could have, you know, yeah. You mean go right from, go right from V one, and then forget about this twenty at a min angle of minus forty five. Go right from V one to writing these components. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, and then adding those, and then um, solving the V three like um, Cartesian components for your A and theta. Uh, and then you solve you, you solve in Cartesian components, and then you have to convert right back because you're in Cartesian. Then you have to go back to polar form. I guess I I think we're doing the same thing. In other words, what what you said is well, let's start with V1 and forget about forget about you know writing 20 at an angle of minus 45. Let's just write 14 minus J um, 14, right? And and I guess I think implicitly what you're doing is um, you're, you're doing that calculation without drawing it, right? Because you're going to say 20 uh, cos negative 45 degrees and then write 14.14. And you're, you're doing 20 sine negative 45 degrees and writing that. I guess I'm, I would consider that a little dangerous in skipping steps if you're doing this kind of problem. 
I would, I would actually write down the intermediate step of, okay, this is the time domain. Let's write down the polar phaser, and then let's convert to the components. Um, all of this is kind of moot with what I'm going to say next. Here's how I would work this problem. I, I am going to recommend that you don't have to, except for understanding in the beginning and doing some practice work, you don't have to draw any of this. You don't have to draw, draw these um, triangles and do this trig. Your calculator, if you have a TI scientific calculator or an HP scientific calculator, it will do this work for you. Um, if I were to solve this problem, and you can try this once you get proficient with your calculator, I can go right from this step where I have cosines, not the sine, but the cosines. Once I have cosine terms, I can enter that phaser directly into my calculator in polar form. I can add those two complex numbers together, and the output when my calculator is in polar form will be this number down here. So I can do this in one step on my calculator. I'm going to recommend this, that, um, and, and I was going here anyway without, without uh, this question, but thank you for asking it, that um, break out your calculator's manual. If you don't have it, just Google it. And on the next homework, after the, uh, the homework after the first order circuits one, you're going to have some phaser problems. In that homework, there's, there's some, some practice. Um, I've got some practice problems and answers. And for example, just adding two complex numbers, dividing two complex numbers in, in different forms. So I give you the problem, I give you the answer. Make sure on your calculator, you're able to uh, and enter complex numbers, add and divide and multiply and subtract complex numbers. Um, and then you don't have to draw any of these triangles. I might write this down. I might write down V1 is 20 at an angle of minus 45. V2 is 10 at an angle of minus 30. I would enter those right in my calculator in polar form or exponential form. I would hit plus. My calculator is RPN. I would hit plus and it would output in polar form this right here. And then I just write this time domain function down. Okay. I'm going to show you another example with impedance where, where I'll talk about that's that's pretty important to be able to um, uh, enter these numbers into your calculator and, and do those calculations quickly. Okay. Other any other questions on on this example before I go to applying this to circuits? We'll work something like this again. Okay. Okay, let's get down to applying this to circuits. Let's talk about impedance. Impedance relates phasor voltage to phasor current, much like resistance um, relates voltage to current. Okay, so let me let me draw this out. If I have a circuit element, right, and I have the circuit element, and I have I've defined a voltage across it, a phasor voltage V, right? So it's a phasor voltage, and I have a phasor current uh, coming into that. Uh, circuit element. I'm going to call that phasor current I. Okay, so phasor voltage, phasor current. I can relate voltage to current with a value we're going to call Z. 
where z is impedance and v equals iz. Just like Ohm's law, V equals IR. Well, in this case with phasers, V equals IZ. Now Z itself is not a phaser. It's a complex number. That's why I have an underline here, but it's not a phaser. It's not a phaser because it doesn't actually represent a sinusoid. It just represents a ratio of uh, phaser voltage divided by phaser current. Z equals V over I, right? It's like a resistance, V over I. Um, and, and it's a complex number. It represents the magnitude difference of phasor voltage versus phasor current, and it also represents a phase difference, the shifting of current and voltage phase with respect to one another. Okay, that's what that represents. So what we're getting to is this. I mentioned last time, really the reason we're using phasors and impedance, one big reason, is because it lets us work with algebra with complex numbers instead of second order differential equations with sinusoids in those equations. There's nothing wrong with working the, uh, with, with working the differential equations with second order. It's, it's just, I think, more convenient to work with phasors and impedance that are complex values. Okay, so what we're going to do is define what the impedance is for a, um, an inductor, a capacitor, and a resistor. And that way, if this box here is an inductor, a capacitor, or a resistor, you can write these Ohm's law-like equations in your circuits. And in fact, you're going to be able to use voltage division, current division, node voltage analysis, Thevenin, just like you would uh, if, these, if this were a DC problem, but let me not get ahead of myself. Let's first define what the impedance is for an inductor. So I have an inductor and we learned this. This is something we know already. We have I of T coming into an inductor and then the voltage V of T equals L di dt. Right, that's from, that's from our inductor studies. Um, if you convert that uh, inductor into the phasor form so that I'm not working with a time domain current, I'm working with a phasor current. Um, and I have a phasor voltage, uh, VL, oh, let's just call it V. Right. Um, I can, relate voltage to current, V equals IZ, by saying that Z sub L, Z sub L is the inductance of an induct, oh, this is the, let me say that again. Z sub L is the impedance of the inductor. And it's going to equal J omega L, I'll say, uh, L, I'll say where that's coming in a minute, coming from in a minute. And if you set this inductance value for the inductor, if you, set, if you set this impedance value for the inductor to J omega L, V equals IZ. Okay. Okay, so I mixed up my words there a bit, but if you have an inductor, the impedance of an inductor is J omega L, and then V equals IZ. That's it. We'll work some problems with that. So let's move on to a capacitor. A uh, professor? Yeah. So is there ever a time where the impedance of the inductor will not equal um, J omega L, or, or does it always equal that? It will always equal that. Okay. And the reason is because if you take, uh, going back to my slide where I said um, when you when you multiply a um, uh, 
in the time domain, it's like multiplying in the, by a constant. It's like multiplying by a constant in the phasor domain. And when you take the derivative in the time domain, it's like multi multiplying the phasor by j omega. That's where that j omega comes from. That j omega comes from the derivative in the time domain. Uh, and it comes from the, uh, the L comes from the L in the time domain. So when you take the derivative, you get the j omega, multiply by L, you get the L, and that's where the V equals IZ uh, comes from in the phasor domain. Okay, so then likewise, does V always equal IZL in the, in the, for inductors? Uh, for every component, V equals IZ, and for inductors, okay. V equals IZ sub L, yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. That's what's nice about this. You just have to remember something that looks like Ohm's law, V equals IZ. And this will work for the capacitor too. So if I have a capacitor, we saw this in the time domain. So VC of T. In fact, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna call that V of T. And then I have a current that's I of T, right? And we saw this again from the last topic that I is equal to C D V D T. Okay. Um, okay. So that uh, means that um, we can also draw, instead of that capacitor, we can draw that impedance that represents the capacitor, Z sub C. And that's, that's a C. And that's a complex number that relates voltage to current. Okay. And for a capacitor, Z is equal to minus J times one over omega C. Okay, it's supposed to be connected. And, and then V equals IZ. Okay, and, and then for a uh, a resistor, right? It's it's really the you can see where this is going. You have some I of T going into the resistor. You have some V of T across the resistor, and V equals I R by Ohm's law. This is R. This is by the way, I didn't write the C here, but that's a C, and this is an L. Um, and then if you represent that resistance as an impedance, Z sub R, and you write in the phasor voltage and the phasor current, then V equals IZ when ZR equals R. And again, V equals IZ. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is <clears throat> we're gonna have a circuit that's expressed in the time domain. It has inductance in Henry's, it has capacitance in microfarads, it has voltages um, that are you know, something cosine omega t plus something, and it has currents. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to convert that time domain schematic into phasor form. And we're going to replace all of our inductances, capacitances, and resistances with impedance, with these formulas. We're gonna replace all the currents with phasor current. We're gonna replace all the time domain voltages with phasor voltages. And then we're gonna work the problem just like it's a DC problem 
but with uh, complex values. Okay, so let's let's do that. Let me set up a problem here. So let's do an example. And I'm going to have a voltage source across series um, components. So let me write that voltage source in. Voltage source Vs of T equals 100 cos 500 T plus 30 degrees and This is the circuit. And let's suppose I have a resistance of 100 ohms. That's an ohm symbol. An inductance of 0 0.3 Henry's and a capacitance of 40 microfarads. And this is volts. And so I turn on that source. Um, and what I do is I, when I turn on the source, I actually get some transients in the circuit. And I'm just going to let that source be on for a while. And you reach what's called a sinusoidal steady state. Now, DC steady state meant all of the voltages and currents became constant. They became DC values. They were just constant values. Sinusoidal steady state means that you still have sinusoidal voltages and currents throughout the circuit, but the amplitudes and the phases have converged to constants. In other words, the voltage across that resistor, its amplitude of its, co of its cosine is a constant. Its phase becomes a constant. It, it, it's, it's an AC signal. It's not a constant voltage but the amplitude and the phase of that voltage are constant. That's what sinusoidal steady state means. Okay, and so what we want to do with this circuit is find, let's say current I1 of T, and let's find voltage uh, Vc of T. Let's find these two voltages. Uh, professor, could you say again um, what values are now constant in the sinusoidal steady state? Mm -hmm. um, all, so where you have A cos omega T plus theta, for, for all of your voltages and currents, all of your voltages and currents are going to have that form. They're all going to be cosines. A, in, sinus, in sinusoidal steady state, A is constant and theta is constant. And actually omega is constant, but all those values are constant. So this is a this is a time varying function, but those values remain constant. Let me say where it's not constant. When you first turn on this source, you get a and uh, a theta varying, and then after some time, they actually converge to be a, uh, constant values. Okay. And so we call once they've converged, and we're not gonna we're not gonna worry about how long that takes. We're just gonna say all these problems, they've reached sinusoidal steady state. So we can assume that all the voltages have a constant amplitude uh, and constant phase, as well as the currents. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sure. So let's find find um, I1 of T and VC of T. And the way we're going to do that is this. I'm going to convert this circuit to its phasor form. So instead of a time domain voltage source, I have a phasor voltage source. Instead of a resistance, I have an impedance that represents that resistor. Instead of an inductor, I have an impedance that represents that inductor. Instead of a capacitor, I have an impedance that represents that capacitor. And then the current I'm looking for is now a phasor, I1 phasor. 
And the voltage I'm looking for is a phaser, VC phaser, okay? So um, what I'm going to do, and we'll do this next time, is figure out what the values are of ZR, ZL, and ZC. And then we're going to work this problem like it's a DC problem, but with complex numbers, okay? So we'll get, we'll figure out what VS is, what these impedances are, and then use voltage division, current division, KVL, KCL, et cetera, V equals IZ, uh, in order to solve for I1 and VC, okay? So let's, uh, so it's, it's uh, let's see, it's 610. Uh, let's, let's close here. So don't forget that homework four is due this Wednesday. So take a look at that on Canvas. Lab four is due this Friday. Again, take a look at that. Uh, see the uh, Slack workspace. There's a channel up there for, well, all of the current assignments. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, post them there and I will be happy or the TAs uh, can answer. I'll have office hours right after class if you want to join. Um, if you're not going to join, um, Thanks for joining class. I hope it's working out well. Let me know if anything isn't. And I will start office hours in just a minute if you want to stick around. If not, see you next time.